It's Waxing Lyrical, baby. Hello, Waxers, and welcome to Waxing Lyrical, Mains and Dutch. I'm your host, Mains, and my colleague, a man who is also announcing his new name on the 2nd of February. It's Mr. Neil Dutton. How are we, Neil? My new name, of course, on the 2nd of February will be the same as it is today, your league champion. Correct. Bravo, 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 bravo. Multiple-time league champ. Yes, our league hasn't had a hasn't had a repeat winner since um, I won it three times in a row. But that was the last of them was back in 2016, and so the league has been bandied about between multiple people. Um, but you know, ending my particular drought, going into week 17 as the underdog, but you know, coming out of it uh, on the other side smelling fresh as a daisy. I'm not going to lie to you; it feels pretty damn good. You've you've dodged the man feel that as COVID Neil to become victorious in this asterisk riddle league league season. Well done. No. All I'll say is, you know, <laughs> just at the end of the day, when the chips are down, you know Devon Singletary will come through for you. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, right? I lost the I lost the league because in one league because of Rex fucking Burkhead. Um, I want to asterisk the motherfucking shit out of this. Um, that's that's all the swear words for today's show. Um, this week, um, it's it's week eighteen. Yes, I know. Weird, isn't it? Still playing games in the regular season on this on, in basically mid January. It's happening. Don't worry about did, it. Did you know though? This is not the first week eighteen in NFL history. It no, was, go on. It's been widely reported that it was in nineteen ninety three. The league went to 18 weeks with two bye weeks for a one-year experiment. They scrapped it after that year. Because we didn't want to give players additional rest time. Why would we? Mm, Good point. Good point. You think the you think the players matter? Mm, Well, half of them won't be playing this week. But then again, that happened. Used to happen in week 17. So it's not a new thing. So focus on um, this week is uh, null and void. Although I am devastated to find out Brandon Staley did an interview today where he won't be taking a knee for for multiple plays, trying to was get us that draw against the Las Vegas Raiders if the if the Jags beat the Colts. Was the West Germany Austria in the nineteen eighty two World Cup yeah, that literally I, just passed it amongst themselves for the entire game to this, knock out? This is so, the second time I've had this conversation on a podcast, and the second time the person on the other end. Of Skype has said the exact same thing of let's get us some West Germany Austria stuff going on. Hey, Thomas Willoughby, the last guy. Um, but good yeah, company, then. yeah, exactly. So it was like, yes, you, accurate. Um, it was never going to happen, but it was a nice dream for. I think he called it coffee shop chat. That's what Brandon Staley called it. Like we're in Hungary in the early nineteen twenties, um, and yet maybe maybe there's no COVID in LA. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, we will be looking back on the season um, to discuss in a fancy view and a non-fancy view. And, and plugged into the mains, I'm going to give you my top three biggest surprise NFL teams and my top three biggest disappointment NFL teams based on what we'd reviewed in the preseason. And our prediction, my predictions, not necessarily Neil. Then we're going to go into fancy. We'll find out how Neil's darlings and losers did this last week. And Neil's then going to give us his top five fancy darlings and fantasy losers for the overall season. I should point out, this isn't based on the people I've picked. This is the overall fantasy darlings and fantasy losers on the season based on where, you know, based on expectation and final delivery. I can't claim credit for any of them, uh, nor would I be so presumptuous to do so. Boo. Anyway, let's get on with the show and let's uh, plug into the mains. So Neil, I, I went back and looked at our week one uh, tape, reviewed it and noticed that we'd kind of looked at teams and how teams were going to get on and, and how they weren't going to get on and, and what have you. Um, and based on that, I've kind of looked at um, top three biggest surprises based on what we'd what I'd said and then top three biggest disappointments again on what I'd said. So we'll start with we'll start with surprises. Um, first team for me, um, New England Patriots, I think. <sighs> I know they won't. They, no, they're not dead. Far from yeah. it. They're on the way back. We didn't say pleasant surprises, did we? So, you know, um, 
the, the best coach in NFL history has made a comeback. Shocking, I know. Not old enough yet. Him has a quarterback. Probably probably like his perfect type of quarterback, i.e. a very good one, who can be moulded to his will. I'm sure, I'm I'm pretty positive that, that Bill Belichick, if you had proved true to him, much preferred the 2004 Tom Brady to the 2017 Tom Brady. I don't think there's any way that that's anywhere the case. I'm sure New England Patriots fans would like Mac Jones to eventually turn into the 2017 um, Tom Brady. The rest of the population do not. However, they've been excellent. Um, I'll be honest, my friend Tony told me that they would be better when they got you know, their COVID, their COVID defence back and I probably just laughed at him. Um, I was wrong. I hate that. I hate it with the passion of a thousand sons. Um, do I think they're going to win the Super Bowl? Well, no. But they're making the playoffs and right now they have a chance, however however slim, to win their division. they got a lot of players back from COVID, but for me, the biggest acquisition they made on defence, despite the fact he continues to wear red sleeves with their blue jumper, which annoys the living piss out of me, is Matthew Judon, who was almost like the perfect Patriot signing. You know, he'd been productive with the Ravens without putting the flashy numbers on film. Like, he was never up there in sacks. He did have quite a few pressures and hits and whatnot. Well, then he comes in to the Patriots, embraces the Patriot way, and has had a career season. Now, obviously, in the past, when they've taken high-prized free agents from Baltimore, they flashed and then disappeared. Yes, I'm talking to you, Adelius Thomas, maybe don't turn up late for practice even in this even in the face of a New England blizzard um, but Matt Judon's been exceptional the defence has been what they want to do and the offence is pretty much how they want to run they want to bully you they want the quarterback to be point guard you know facilitate what you will yeah. and you know to make a play when he has to and Matt Jones has been excellent the Patriots have surprised me I say I, th- I thought that maybe this would be the this is my last year I'm leaving you with a quarterback go do good things with it while I go and finally write that book but now I just I'm under the impression that Bill will never retire yeah I think that's fair um, let's move on to, to team two um, and that is the Cincinnati Bengals or the AFC North champion Cincinnati Bengals can I interrupt you though and do to point out, I don't know if you're going to mention it, but I feel that credit should be due here. Yeah. You did have them. I remember this saying they would finish ahead of two teams in the AFC North. Well, they're going to finish. Ahead, they finished ahead of three of them. Exactly. So I did. Hats off to you for having faith. I, I did, but I didn't think they were going to win the division. Um, I don't. I didn't think that at all. Um, I said they had a chance to 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 do that. Um, and that was kind of... I did think they'd finish ahead of the Steelers and there was a possibility they'd finish ahead of the Browns, I think, because the Ravens were going to win the division, um, which we'll come on to later. Um, I, what I like about the, the Bengals is um, they caught themselves in a, in, a, in, a, in a draft storm at the start of the year, a kind of philosophical debate, <laughs> a, a left-wing versus right-wing, or what we will sh- shall call... What skill player versus offensive against lineman debate, whether they should take Penny Sewell or Jamar Chase. Um, I think, Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we both believe they should take Penny Sewell because if they didn't, Joe Burrow may die. Um, not that we didn't think that Jamar Chase was good. Um, to be fair, Joe Burrow has nearly died on multiple occasions. Um, so that logic still stands. However, um, Jamar Chase has been rather worldly. And Joe Burrow's got, pff, let's be honest, massive testicles. You, the, the one thing you hate to see in quarterbacks, and there was a video of Baker Mayfield funny in this division where they just, you see the all 22 and you see the three places where they can throw it and they just can't pull the trigger anymore. The opposite of that is, is Joe Burrow against the Chiefs, who was quoted as saying, I'll just effing throw it up because Jamar will probably catch it. Him just no, not bothered by the fact he could throw an interception. If I, I was speaking about this on the Touchdown Review podcast, if I had a little bit of concern about the Cincinnati Bengals, it is that this will mask the fact that I don't believe their head coach is very good at his job. I mean, I don't know if anyone watched the final minute and a half of the game against the Chiefs, but it was comedy slash disaster written all over it. 
I understand not wanting Patrick Mahomes to score a touchdown. I have no problem with that. I understand you want to not get any time left on the clock, but what you did was close to suicidal. Okay, it worked. Bravo. I'm not sure it'll work again. Um, but the Bengals have been better than we expected, and they put, although some injuries permitting, they put beatdowns on the Bengals tw- twice and the Steelers twice. And for Cincinnati Bengals fans, that's probably, I don't know, 30 years in the making. Interesting statistic. Baker Mayfield and Joe Burrow have the exact same sack rate this season. One of these quarterbacks, can, however, has the players around him to make plays when he's under pressure. The other one does not and can't make the plays himself. Hmm. Joe Burrow obviously has benefited from the fact they've said, look, we can protect, we can lose slowly on the offensive line, which, listening to J.T. O'Sullivan over the years, that's what he wants. Ben Fennell and DeFran Duffy say the same thing as well. Just lose slowly. If the if the rush is straight in my yeah. face, I can't do anything. If you can just keep them off, and if you've got court, uh, wide receivers like Jamar Chase and T. Higgins, who'd be a number one wide receiver anywhere else. Agreed. Um, they've got a serviceable tight end in CJ. They've got a good running back. The, again, you talk about free agent acquisition. Troy Hendrickson was a one-year wonder with the Saints. The Bengals yeah. saw something they liked, and he's been exceptional. You would hope that what they do moving forward is continue to invest in the line to help imp- to help keep Burrow up a bit, to lose slowly again, and help him make plays. But if you're thinking you know, ahead of teams you want to be investing in in fantasy, well, the Bengals were a low-key team coming into 2021. You're not getting these players at a discount next year. I'll tell you that now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Final team, Neil, um, which I think we or I've poured dirt on twice, uh, and now it's the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, I think we poured dirt to them at the start of the season, as we were far from convinced by John Gruden. We were far from convinced by John Gruden, the coach, not John Gruden, the human. And we found out that we should have been less convinced by John Gruden, the human. He was fired for, yes, being a not very nice person. Um, Then I think the star wide receiver basically ended lives and careers and his own career um, however they are in a win and in game on Sunday Night Football against the Los, Los Angeles Chargers and although I would say the Chargers are favourites I would not be surprised if the Las Vegas Raiders won and that should be a commendation for all the people on the roster and especially someone like Derek Carr I think Derek Carr has assumed a bigger leadership role in the vacuum that was left when Gruden went. Um, Rich, uh, Richie Basaccia, or Pistachio, as I officially called him, um, he hasn't come out, he hasn't made waves. I think he knows he's just keeping the seat warm for someone else. So Derek Carr has been front and centre, which is where quarterbacks are supposed to be. When you're winning, it's fine. Uh, when you're losing, it's a terrible place to be. I think the Raiders are still in the player shout due to the weird nature of this season without any excellence on their part I mean I think they've scored more than 17 points once in their last five games or something their defence has made plays I think Max Crosby has been exceptional this season he was good last year and he seems to be rounding into the edge rusher they've been looking for since Khalil Mack was traded away Hmm. so obviously now that that brain trust has gone they might pay him to keep him. Just a thought. Um, I think, though, that if they were to get into the playoffs, it would paper over even more cracks than what the Bengals have. This is a, a franchise that has had a number of early round draft picks in the last few years and has wasted a lot of them. Um, yeah, I mean, you, I think our opinions on what you do with running backs and when you take them are on record. You can go back and listen to them if you want. If you take Josh Jacobs fourth overall, and don't use him as a run- as a receiver, you weren't watching him properly in college. And then to wait three years in and start using him as a receiver when he's had two years of being kicked, the crap kicked out of him in the pit, I think you probably aren't using him at the best. Offensively, they've you know they're limited. Um, you know Hunter Renfro, who'd have thought you know fifty year old white slot receivers can be- can start becoming playmakers when there's no one else to throw to. It's a team. It's a roster that's not in great shape 
you do wonder what a new front office, because you assume Mayock is going to be blamed for a lot of the roster decisions he didn't make, but he was Gruden's guy. You assume what the new person comes in. Do they start looking and think, look, we haven't got many commodities that we can get much for. So do we think about offering Derek Carr to a team struggling at quarterback, looking for something of an upgrade on what they've already got, Cleveland, um, you know, something like that. Or do they say, look, just extend and we'll ride them out and build elsewhere. They're going to be a fascinating team to watch this off season. And as I say, they have surprised us because usually they start very well and fall away completely. They started well, fell away and then came back up again. Not all the way to the top, but as I say, they're winning in. So it's hard to say they're not a surprise. It's um, it's it's big news for um, Jim Harbour when he takes over. Um, oh my god, Neil! I, I, I'll be honest. I haven't, I haven't picked the Philadelphia Eagles as a top three biggest surprises, which is outrageous. But it's mainly because we're going to speak about them next week as as a playoff team, and I'm assuming we're going to talk about them for ages. They have. When they been... win it, you mean? Sorry. When they win the Super Bowl, you know? that of course. Um, they have been probably the biggest surprise in terms of numbers from most wins I thought they were going to get to wins they have got. I was, you know, happy to take the the Bengals praise, but did say there was a chance they could be as bad as the New York Giants, which pff, is criminal because no one's as bad as the New York Giants. And I apologise to Philadelphia for that. Well, the 2018 um, New England Patriots was as bad as the New York Giants. Because when they were seven and two at the halfway mark of that season, they were all getting fired. Apparently, good point, well made. Um, won the Super Bowl, by the way. Um, you're a liar, won, Joe. Having been to the Super Bowl the year before, yeah, you lie, Joe. You tell lies, big lies, not even lies that you can get away with. I, I, imagine though being so bad that like it makes you, you slag off Washington and they come out as the good guys. That's not a good position to be in. You should never be the good guys in a Washington conversation. <laughs> Now, if you have to start any sentence with we're not a clown show, I'm terribly sorry, but there's a good chance you are. I think I, I was talking about this with, I think it was Taib, and I was saying, like, there seems to be a movement in Jacksonville who, who we believe have got 37 fans to wear clown suits. And I haven't seen pitchforks giants of Giants fans who are in the, one of the biggest cities in the world because their head coach, who is a joke, is coming back. Do the fans not care? I think it comes back to that old adage of you can't boo and yawn at the same time. Mm. So I think, you know, people are literally have just. The Giants have managed it. The last time they were this inept for this long, they did something completely franchise altering and hired Bill Parcells, which was a risk at the time, mm. but it worked. However, the Giants, when they were run then, were a bit more savvy with how they were run the front office now. John Maher is an idiot. Steve Tisch doesn't seem to care. You're running one of the signature franchises in NFL history into the ground. Evan Silver and Matt Kelly called it two years ago when they said literally the, fr- the Giants front office was being run by the words of Mike Francesa, which he denied because of course he would. The Giants denied it because of course they would. And they have done absolutely nothing to arrest the slide since then. Maybe it's time to start listening to Francesa again, because at least that way you blagged a playoff appearance once in a while. Now exactly. it's you have a, you've been in one playoff game since you won the Super Bowl. You haven't won a playoff game since you won the Super Bowl, and that division. I say Washington looked like they might fall into relevance. They didn't. The Eagles have won a Super Bowl in that time and been to the playoffs three times, four times. Sorry. The Dallas Cowboys, I think, have had three, two different spells as the number one seed in the NFC. They haven't done anything as well, which is hilarious in its own right. You're the only franchise in a mediocre division who is going backwards with no sign of good things to come because you have no cap space and 32 players under under contract for next year, and everyone is paying. You're paying everyone. Amazing. Every one of those 32 is going to get paid. You even had to re restructure the contracts this year of your kicker and your punter just to provide enough operational capital to get through the season Amazing, they're, they're a joke it's cool isn't it it's great I love it let's move on to the three, top three biggest disappointments because we knew the Giants were going to be garbage um, 
I, much like we have done in the past with the Patriots, I decreed that I would believe that the, the, the Seattle Seahawks would make the playoffs when they didn't make the playoffs. And I would suggest that they were bad once they didn't make the playoffs. Guess what? The Seattle Seahawks are bad. Arsenal. They're not, well, yeah, probably worse. The problem is going to become if they are Arsenal and we, we go down that tree in, in four years. When everyone's like, it actually wasn't that bad having Arsene Wenger as our coach, was it? Because we're even worse now than we were then, is an issue. Um, they are going to be an outrageously noisy franchise, I think, because there will be calls and pos- I don't know if I don't know if they've got the testicular fortitude to fire P. Carroll. Um, if they don't. And even if they do, I expect Russell Wilson to want to leave. Um, there's a conversation around whether that is actually a sensible thing to do, as you have no real, no major talent to speak of, apart from possibly the two wide receivers. And one of them um, is already denying that he wants to leave, which means he does. Exactly right. So, And the issue that the, the Seahawks have always had is, you know, you mentioned the NFC East and, you know, oh, bravo. The, the the Philadelphia Eagles made the playoffs four years or whatever. Yeah, it's not hard. Like they're in the NFC East, for fuck's sake. But, but the 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 Seattle Seahawks are not in the NFC East. They're in the NFC West, and that's hard. And it seems to be getting harder. So um, a rebuild may be in order. Yeah, as you say, I'm not going to say it's because it, it, he comes from a college background. Because obviously he was an NFL coach first, but. College coaches have the benefit that the players turn over an awful lot more regularly in the NFL, so the message can stay fresh. It, the message has gone completely. The only people left from the glory days are Bobby Wagner, who's still up there at his position, Russell Wilson and Pete Carroll. But I think Russell Wilson's had his fill of what Pete Carroll's got to say. Um, and, you know, for whatever reason, he, he has chemistry with Tyler Lockett, whatever chemistry he had with DK Metcalf disappeared halfway through the season. Maybe due to how DK Metcalf spends his time and with whom. I don't want to get into that, though, without any any evidence. Let's, um, not, let's not do that. Let's, yeah. let's leave that um, one alone. I mean, I saw an article today about um, one of their few defensive playmakers, Quandre Diggs, and it was, what would it take for him to go back to the Detroit Lions. And Doug Farrar, who I think is a Seahawks fan, I know he's, he's based on that way, said, well, the fact that the Seahawks overpaid their £220 edge rusher means, uh, will mean they can't pay him. Well, we know who you mean there, Doug. You know, it's the it's, it's the safety you, you, you signed, you traded your future away, who can't play safety. Yeah, it's, it's bad. There's just a lot of badness in this team. I didn't think they'd be awful because I thought they'd do enough to be middling like they always do but then what happens Russ got hurt Russ missed games Russ came back with you know doing 29 hours of rehab after, a day after never sleeping yeah after never sleeping and who'd have thought he'd looked shell shocked because he's sleep deprived and it took him into the last game of the season second to last game of the season and the Detroit Lions for the offence to look explosive but that's what happens. You see, when you you know you spend a first round pick on a running back and wait for that four years for him to start coming good. Perfect. In a team that you thought would be good, Neil, who who haven't been, um, and that's the Minnesota Vikings. Um, can you please, for the love of God, um, stop thinking this team under the tutelship of Kirk Coupons is going to be a relevant playoff worthy franchise? I don't blame Kirk Cousins, I blame Mike Zimmer. This team wants to play in one-score games. The only explanation for how many they play in, that's how he wants them. They don't want to run up the score on people. They don't want games to be out of, out of reach by the third quarter. Mike Zimmer wants them to be this close. He wants to embrace variance. You're an idiot. I mean, who'd have thought that at the moment that it would become the most vital that Kirk Cousins be on there on the field for his team is the moment he contracts COVID. Who would have possibly thought me, that would ever happen? That's me, right, everyone. Me and every Washington fan and every Minnesota fan. Yeah, and Mike Zimmer and especially knew it was going to happen. Kirk Cousins is that dodgy old woman in the fiesta 
She has never, ever been in an accident in her entire life, but she has seen fucking thousands of them. Mm-hmm. He is at the scene of so many crimes. They're in one-score games because he throws back-breaking interceptions at back-breaking times. They're in one-score games because he can make outrageous comebacks with his unbelievable wide receivers. No, $84 million guaranteed. What a fucking waste. You've gone backwards as a franchise. Well, they got to the NFC Championship game with Case Keenum the year before he arrived. That's what I'm saying. Gone backwards as a franchise. And guess what, Minnesota fans? If you haven't seen this story before, sign generational wide receiver. Generational wide receiver has amazing rookie season. Generational wide receiver is really good. Then gets bored of your franchise being crap and wants to leave. It's going to happen. Final team, Neil, which is a bit harsh, is the Baltimore Ravens. Why it's harsh is... They basically had no players left. They had no running backs before the season even started. They've lost Lamar Jackson, and you go, okay. And then you got Tyler Huntley, and he looked okay. And then he didn't play one game, and you're like, oh, who's playing now? And he goes, Josh Johnson. And you're like, didn't Josh Johnson play for four other franchises this season? He's like the COVID guy who just comes in and plays for different teams. They've had no cornerbacks since, I don't know, about week six. And somehow they were still in playoff contention at the end of the season. John Harbour is an unbelievable coach. But it must be a massive disappointment for the franchise as a whole that they're not going to challenge for a Super Bowl. It must be, especially because, you know, from where they were on their quarterback's journey, this was the year to really make the big decisions on him. Mm. Now, I know he was OK when he first came in. Then he had his MVP season. Then he had a bit of a drop-off. It was like, OK, well, where is he? Is he between the two seasons can he get back to the MVP is he going to go down and at times we saw him put the offence on his back at times we saw him look you know shell shocked at times because the line was a bit of a turnstile we saw the defence fall off massively and if there's one thing we know about the Baltimore Ravens that does not stand no. I'm not saying just because they just because they lost Matthew Judon they became a wreck it's as you say they're cornerbacks the 2011 to 2019 2020 Philadelphia Eagles cornerbacks are laughing at what the Ravens are putting out there. Scary, it was really pathetic. It, I mean, the fact is that Cooper Cup was had six for 94 against them, and that was disappointing. Six for 94 would have been the best return by any wide receiver against the Ravens for the best part of the decade that mm. came before us, but that was a disappointing showing. They are a franchise that we know tends to bounce back. But an awful lot rides on the availability, the durability of Lamar Jackson. He's missing games. He's getting sick every other week, it seems. I mean, you've got kids. I've got kids. They're always ill. Yeah, but they're not quarterbacks. Yeah. You know, and it's always, oh, it's a non-COVID illness. We probably need to get that seen to then. Because probably, there's yeah. something wrong here. Um, so they need to look at, well, how best do we maximise him? How do we get to it? Do we invest in running back? Or do we just going to say, sorry, we have invested. We've got J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards coming back. Well, that's great. That's the offence sort of then. Your cornerbacks are a great tragedy. So they are a disappointment in the sense that we don't expect... We've been accustomed to the Ravens not being bad. Yeah. And what they've not been bad, because they could still technically make the playoffs. But I don't think if you'd asked them... If you'd said to the Ravens, in week 18, you need this, this and this to go right for you to make the playoffs. Is that a successful season? They'd spit in your face and slam the door. Correct, correct. That's it, Neil, for um, plugged into the mains. Surprises, <laughs> Patriots, Bengals, Raiders, disappointments, Seahawks, Vikings, Ravens. Obviously, massive surprises, Eagles, but we will get onto them later on, I am sure. Neil, let's move fantasy-wise and let's go to your fantasy darling. Hello, darling. So, Neil, final week last week, you picked one. You picked Trey Lance. He was quarterback nine, 21.4 points. That's a massive win. That meant you were 23 and 28 overall, a 45% success rate for fancy darlings, which is okay. This the week, annoying thing is, just to interrupt, is when I did my ones for Nat show, I did Trey Lance. Gerald Everett, who did nothing, despite the Seahawks scoring 50, and the Bears' defence. 
which scored over 20 points. Nice, nice. That would have been 2 and 1, but there we go. There we go. Neil, this week, as we're not doing fantasy, this week you wanted to look at the overarching fantasy darlings of the NFL fantasy season. So please hit us with those top five. Well, the very first one, as incredible as it may seem, is the overall fantasy MVP, in my opinion. That's Cooper Cup. And the reason he's a fantasy darling is because, although he finished as the wide receiver one, he was the wide receiver 18 in ADP. Now, it, it's all very well, you know, people to look back and say, oh, we, we didn't know this was going to be this good. And, you know, his on-off splits between his previous career and what he's put up in this year is phenomenal. If you have a situation where you can say about anyone, the only player who did that better was Jerry Rice, you've probably had a pretty good season as a wide receiver. Jerry Rice is the only wide receiver who's had more PPR points in a season than Cooper Cup. And you say, extra game? No, no. That's over 16 games. 16, you know, it might be an extra week. Yeah, yeah. He's did it in 16 games. Um, Cup, his lowest score in PPR scoring was 11.4. He was a wide receiver one 13 times in 16 game weeks. And he scored 21 points or more 12 times. I think, Neil, if we, if we use a concept of players who win new leagues, correct me if I'm wrong, you, as you described yourself as the league champion in our league of record, you are Cooper Cup. Mm-hmm. We are in a dynasty league, uh, won by um, Rich, the Falcons fan. Mm-hmm. Rich had Cooper Cup. Now, that doesn't mean that if you had Cooper Cup, you were guaranteed to win your fantasy playoffs or fantasy league, but by Jove, did it help? And as you said, to go from the 18th wide receiver taken to being the best wide receiver in the game, and that makes you probably a top five fantasy player overall, is really going to help you. Absolutely. Number two, Neil. Number two, a player who was taken as the wide receiver 37 in ADP, but finished as the wide receiver three, Debo Samuel. His lowest score of the season was 10.2 points back in week three. He was a wide receiver one seven times, and he scored between 60. He scored 16 or more PPR points in a game 11 times. He started the season by being by getting there as a traditional wide receiver, as in you know catching the ball downfield, racking up yards, scoring touchdowns. But then towards the back end of the season, when he became the auxiliary running back for the 49ers, he had 6.4 rushing attempts per game from week 10. Um, so again. I think people, I think a lot of people were excited about Brandon Ayuk. They were certainly excited about George Kittle, which is why they were taking him ahead of the likes of Darren Waller. Which I'm not going to knock people doing that. He's the best all round tight end in the game. Of course, mm-hmm. you're going to do it, even though people would say to you, nah, he's not going to have the volume. If the 49ers are good, he's not going to have the volume. Debo's, I'm not sure how much it's going to go forward because that's an awful lot of punishment. And I know he's a big bugger. But ultimately, if you want wide receivers taking rushing attempts, you want them on jet sweeps. You don't want them running under, you know, you know, in between the tackles. But for where he was taken and for what he produced, he was exceptional. The thing that I find interesting about Debo Samuel is twofold. I think when you would have talked about him at the start of the season, you would have said, "Oh, well, you know, not only is he going to catch the ball, but he'd be involved in jet sweeps and you know, maybe run it every now and again." You didn't expect him to be like. You know, and every down back at some point, and also, like I won't be taking Debo Samuel next year because I have a no Shanahan draft policy because that te- no team with it under Shanahan le- leadership can be trusted to understand who's going to get the ball and who's not. So, like Debo Samuel was great this year, but maybe disappear into like missing persons next year. Yeah, he is the Veruca Salt of NFL coaches in the sense that he wants it now. Doesn't know what it is, doesn't necessarily know what it's for, but he wants it. And then doesn't maybe make do of what he has. Neil, number three, please. Number three, had to be a tight end, of course. We had to get one in here. Uh, Dalton Schultz, who a lot of people, including myself, dismissed as an afterthought after a pretty good 2020, uh, 2020 season. He was the tight end 33 in ADP. It's noticeable that Blake Jarwin, his teammate, was the tight end 24 
in ADP. And Schultz finished as the tight end four overall. He was a tight end one ten times. I know the bar is lower than it is for other positions, but still. Um, he was second on the Dallas Cowboy in Yak out of everyone. So C D Lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, which is another pissing injury that you know at this late stage of the season you feel for the lad. Um but Jarwin wasn't ju- sorry, um Schultz wasn't just chipping in as among the top tight ends. He was a top five tight end in terms of fancy points five times. It's also a nod to his efficiency. Um, he had 24.6 receiving fantasy points over expectation, which is an efficiency metric, and that was the most of any Dallas pass catcher. So while we all wowed you know, with the weapons on display, you know, Amari Cooper and C.D. Lamb and all these people, the steadiest course of action was to go to Dalton Schultz, and that's why they did. You know, we regularly talk about um, in in preview shows at the start of the season how there's maybe three or four tight end that you would take, and then the rest is just you know pick one. Up. The yeah, pick them up late as possible. You know, Dalton Schultz here is tight end thirty three. Do you expect Dalton Schultz to be someone who people will look to draft it as you know? A tight end in the of their first, you know, a, a tight end one, so to speak, of you know, in the first group, you may not pick him early, but he'd be the one you're going to take. No, I, I, I can see him falling into the mid range because of what he's done the last two years, and draft strategy shows you that you either take a tight end early or you take it late. Mm-hmm. So you either get one of the big guns or you just leave it, and you know the ones that come in rounds like 5 to 12 they very rarely pan out and I can see him falling in that because it's oh he's been good for two years yes I know he has but that means he's going to be overdrafted so there's a, I mean, it depends on Blake Jarwin you know I, I'm not sure of Schultz's contract status I don't think he's a free agent but I think 2022 might be his contract year I could be wrong so you, you ideally you want a piece of the Cowboys passing attack and he may be the cheapest way to get a piece of it again next year but I still worry that he might be too expensive Who's number four Neil? Number four is someone who for large parts of the season was ignored because he was certainly ignored in the draft he pretty much went undrafted in most leagues and that's uh, the sun guard himself Amon Rasen Brown and he's a fancy darling because of what he did when it counted uh, in the last five weeks of the season, so weeks 13 to 17, uh, 57 targets, number three among wide receivers, 43 receptions, two, 451 yards, five, four touchdowns, tied for second, 125 PPR points, second. He averaged 25 PPR points per game in the running. And of course, in week 17, he was sat on my bench to tell you that I was not bricking it while Brandon Cooks did naff all would be a lie um, he is he, I I picked him up in so I drafted Amar Amon Rasin Brown in our Dynasty League but I also have um, Stefan Diggs CD Lamb and Keenan Allen so in our fancy semi-final, the Re- what I will describe as the Rex Burkhead game, um, I had the choice of Amon Ra or C.D. Lamb. You obviously picked C.D. Lamb. They were playing Washington. Uh, they scored 56 points and C.D. Lamb got six. So I was the opposite of, of... We both had them on our bench, but it affected one of us more than the other. I worry that Amon Marson Brown is going to be a classic case of being overdrafted next year because as well as he did in the last few weeks of the season, and as I say, the numbers bear it out, he played very well. Mm. No TJ Hawkinson, no DeAndre Swift. They have a surefire need of proven talent. They need to get talent at wide receiver. Is Amon Marson Brown going to project for you know 200 targets next year? No, of course not. So... I think he'll be overdrafted. I think Jalen Waddle will be overdrafted as well because of what he did is fantastic to look at, but look at the target competition or lack thereof. So thank you very much, Amon. Amon Ra. But I suspect that's the best fantasy run you'll ever have. Um, Neil, number five. Number five is a little-known player who, you know, he's one of those plucky underdogs that we really like to get behind. Um 
he finished uh, third in his position despite being drafted ninth which doesn't sound like a lot but when you consider it's a onesie position and you know we don't really care about it but you have to say finally Tom Brady is going to start getting his due because as I say he was drafted quarterback nine behind such people as you know Matt Stafford uh, Kyler Murray Justin Herbert who were all very good Justin Herbert was exceptional of course um, Brady was quarterback one ten times. He only had two games when he was outside the top 24, and he had eight games when he was the quarterback six or higher. The big knock on Brady coming into the season was no rushing production, of course. When you have an insane touchdown rate, which he did have, you can meet that halfway, and he did. So if you had Tom Brady, you might not have felt good about it at the time because, oh, he's not going to do it again. Well, he did, pretty much. I love the idea that like we slag people off because they've got no one to throw it to, and then like all of his wide receivers disappeared for a multitude of different reasons: injuries, star jumps, and other such things. Um, and he was just throwing bombs to LSU track stars who didn't play NFL in college. And anyone, anyone who in any form of sport in the year of our Lord 2022 is succeeding with a player called Siddle, <laughs> my hat goes off to you. Bravo. Bravo. That's it for darlings. Let's let's get a bit dark on here and let's go with the fancy losers. Losers. Neil, last week you told us that Dalvin Cook would finish outside of the top ten. Um, he got four point three points. I don't know what that is, but it's definitely outside the top ten. It's outside the top twenty. I think it's outside the top fifty. That gave you an overall record of 12-5 and five on Fancy Losers, which is a 71% success rate. As I've said before, Neil knows a loser. I mean, he's made to me for a start. Other such jokes can be found later on. Neil, who do we have as the Fancy Losers of the overall season? No. I need to qualify this statement straight away because, yeah, because the just... temptation is to say anyone who got taken in the first round because that first round stunk. However, as we don't draft people, I assume we don't, assuming they're going to get hurt, I'm not blaming people who drafted Christian McCaffrey, Derek Henry. So, my first fantasy loser, big loser, is Ezekiel Elliott, who was the RB5 but finished as the RB17 in PPR points. In fancy points, uh, fancy points per game. He had six running back one weeks. Only two of them in the top six. Ezekiel Elliott didn't win you games this season in fancy football. He just didn't. It started in week one where he was a passenger as they you know passed and passed and passed. He never he was never he never looked like being the workhorse he was in sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen. He's lost a step. He doesn't have the burst. So. You took him as a top five. If you take someone in the top five, you, you're you hoping the upside is potential running back one. And he never looked like he was going to be it. The, the bit I don't understand about the Dizzy here, I think, is why anybody ever took him in the first place. So Touchdowns? The, well, yeah, but that is a, that's a transient stat. It's not something that, you can, that can be relied upon. So, no. yeah, okay, fair enough. But, you know... You haven't been watching Dallas Cowboy games, which means you don't watch NFL at 9.25 on, on Sky or whatever, because, you know, they're on all the time. Um, if you didn't know that Ezekiel Elliott had lost a step. So, your loss. Um, Neil, number two. Number two, it's another running back in the first round. I know what I said, but I'd say this is a minimum of 10 games played, and that's Saquon Barkley, who was the running back nine. So, there was a bit of, not much hope that he'd be Saquon Barkley. But to finish as running back 31 in fancy points per game is a bit of a blow. He had three running back one weeks. Only one of them came after week four. He only had one week higher than running back nine. He's toast. Now, I'm not saying it's all on him. I'm not saying he's failed the Giants. The Giants have failed him. But after that first rookie season where he was force-fed targets and he looked explosive, he's not the same player now. And I don't think he ever will. Well, we, we've seen statistically the comeback doesn't happen. Even that first year, though, 
for where you drafted him, that wasn't what you wanted. Because if you look deeper in the numbers on Saquon Barkley, it was one yard, one yard, one yard, one yard, 25 yards. Do you know, that's not sustainable. And then you get injured, which probably means that of the yards you're going to lose, it's the 25. For the love of all that is sacred, stop taking running backs so high. Not only are we saying these running backs failed <coughs> as um, fantasy players, these are two top five NFL draft players who I just think have completely underperformed. And I don't, Dallas people, don't be telling me that Ezekiel Elliott has been a good draft pick because he hasn't. Because I'll tell you who else was in that draft and you could have got him and he would have been better. It's not, and you then doubled down on it and gave him a load of money. So you have to play him when you've got a better running back on the bench. Saquon Barkley should not get a new contract with the New York Giants, and if they do that, it's just insanity. Mm. And it's sad because running backs aren't, you know, we joke saying they don't matter. They don't matter for me. Big picture, season after season after season. But fancy football is a seasonal, you know, it's a seasonal business, and you want to see running backs do well. I mean, I, I came into the league, and every team that was the, that was your that was your fulcrum that was the engine and I know it, it's becoming a passing league yeah but look how many thousand yard rushes there were look how many great players look how many MVP candidates were running backs still and now well, you know you see we saw last year a, a, a fellow ran for two thousand yards and no one gave a shit it's, just... it's crazy it's crazy you know I'm just gonna play a game um, Jalen Ramsey Ronnie Stanley the Forrest Buckner um, Ryan Kelly yeah you know William Jackson no it's clear what Kenny they should Clark. have done they should have taken Jalen Ramsey and then drafted Derek Henry in the second round well exactly right yeah. that's but you know whatever let's, let's be glad he didn't um, uh, loser number three Neil loser number three we've talked about before to DK Metcalf and the reason he's a loser even though he finished wide receiver 13 he was the wide receiver 4 in PPR, sorry, in ADP. So again, you thought he was going to be the creme de la creme. Now, he had a season of two halves himself because in weeks one to eight, he was averaging 7.25 targets per game, 4.9 receptions, 72.5 yards, and a touchdown per game, 18.1 PPR points per game. Second half of the season, his targets, his targets per game went up to 8.4. His receptions went down to four. His yards went down to 41, and he went down to half a touchdown a game, 11.2 PPR points. We thought we were seeing the second coming of Megatron. It actually will look like the second coming of Mike Williams. I think the issue you will always find with the wide receiver, and I think we've got another one coming up, is that for the majority of them, you need a, a decent quarterback to be able to do it and in a decent offensive scheme right and for the vast majority of the season DK Metcalf had neither now the problem is for, for Metcalf is you know is he going to have it next season I don't know because we don't know what the quarterback position is going to be like and we don't know what the head coaching or the coaching staff as a whole is um, massive buyer beware for me same for Tyler Locker I know he's not on here but um, you know I, unless I know something completely different in six months, I won't be taking any Seattle Seahawks players. Uh, Neil, um, number four. Number four is Terry McLaurin. And I say this is a pisser because Terry McLaurin, from a talent point of view, was a wonderful wide receiver. He was the wide receiver 10 in ADP. He was the wide receiver 25 in fancy points per game. Now, he had four wide receiver one weeks. Coincidentally, they were the four weeks he actually found the end zone which shows you what, what the type of data the team Washington were. They weren't going to pass the ball an awful lot. So, Terry McLaurin wasn't going to gobble up targets, so he needed a touchdown to get home, and Washington didn't score that many touchdowns, so it crippled them. Obviously, he was hurt. He's, he looks like he's one of those players who's always going to play nicked up, which I'm not mm. blaming them for. Of course, they play a violent sport. AJ Brown doesn't practice. You're going to tell me he's a flop? You tell him. I'm not. <laughs> not telling um, them. But I just think that McLaurin is... 
he's on the Alan Robinson career path. I think I think the thing yes, you're right, by the way. Um quarterback is an issue. And then it's a different issue for Seattle, right? It's like, oh, he's had Taylor Haneke all season. You're like, yeah, but he wasn't supposed to. Like, imagine a, a not as good version, a not as strong arm version of Ryan Fitzpatrick. It's not not what anyone signed up for. And okay, Tyler Haneke did okay. But you're not a starting quarterback in the NFL. Like, let's not be playing that game. Like, Washington head office, if you're listening. First of all, fix your fucking stadium. You're an embarrassment to the NFL. And uh, second of all, that's not quarterback. So let's not do that. Like, it's cute and that. You know, it's, he's plucky and whatever. Fine, great, not a quarterback. Like, go away. And Terry McLaurin, if if they don't get a proper quarterback, should be asking to leave. The other issue for McLaurin is name the wide receiver two on the Washington football team. Correct. There isn't one. So therefore, he gets a lot of a lot of um, a lot of coverage going his way. Even Logan Thomas, who is probably the second best pass catcher, was out for eight weeks. It's basically just go and run somewhere. Mr. McLaurin and see if you can get free and he did a lot but nowhere near enough yeah final one Neil final one and I do hate myself for saying it because the kid and he is a kid has achieved something special as a rookie that's Kyle Pitts the second tight end to have a thousand yards as a rookie the first in over 60 years which by the way can we just put some context a thousand yards for a tight end in 1960 is worth what? Two and a half thousand yards it's now? A million. It's a million. It's got to it be. Was in, in 14 games. So, the issues I have with Carl Pitts, and I say issues, and it's again, it's a, it's a matter of perception. I would not have taken Carl Pitts as the tight end four. So, basically, what you people were telling me is they were taking Carl Pitts ahead of. Mark Andrews, who finishes the tight end one. TJ Hawkinson, who finishes the tight end five, I think, in, point, in points per game. They took him you know, ahead of Dalton Schultz, obviously, below that. He finishes the tight end ten in fancy points per game. Why and how? Well, I'll tell you why, because I'll just give you a few little stats for you here. Cal Pitts was third among all tight ends in deep targets. He was tenth in red zone targets. He had 10 targets inside the 10-yard line. That was tied for 8th. And he had 10 inside the 5-yard line, tied for 13th. Why was he only tight end 10? Because he didn't score touchdowns. Because he's got one touchdown. One touchdown. None in the United States. Congratulations. You, you traded Julio Jones so you could sign an otherworldly talent who you also can't get in the fucking end zone. I did see a press report. I was on Twitter. It was one of the Falcons beat writers who said, um, Kyle Pitts not spotted today at practice. I think it was Scott Pianowski said, oh, they must have been working on their red zone drills today then. It just, it, yeah, it's, just, it's criminal, to be honest. He's an amazing talent, right? But, like... Have if, a plan. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. How you can... It's not like he's... It's not like he's five foot two and one hundred and fifty pounds, man. Like get get the dude in the end zone in the corners and get throw it to him. Like, do you know what I mean? I mean, this, the big the big thing that we all thought maybe was you know if uh, Julio Jones was gone, it was going to be Calvin Ridley and Kyle Pitts. Well, that's fine. He can step into that. But when Calvin Ridley doesn't play, and it's Kyle Pitts, Russell yeah. Gage, Olamide Zacchaeus, and you know the second coming of Jim Brown himself, Cordell Patterson, can you cope with being the main focus? of this offence and the kid and again I'll stress he's a kid couldn't I mean, he had 200 yard games I think and one of them again wasn't in the United States of America could he be a very good player moving forward yeah of course he could the tight end position needs this injection of talent mm. you know we've still got you know young players like TJ Hawkinson Noah Fant these people who are still a quarterback away from being superstars at their position Travis Kelsey's it's off now the wide the tight end one crown it's gone you're not that you know you, when you know when you started, you were the master, but now Mark Andrews has taken that off you. You've got Kyle Pitts coming up. Have a competent plan for what you're going to do with quarterback, and use these players. But here's another thing: what you should do when you have an aging quarterback and you're going to trade your franchise's leading receiver of all time, don't draft a 
keeping tight end fourth overall. I don't care who he is. Don't do it. If he's the best player in the draft, that says something about the draft. There's probably an issue not to pay your quarterback um, $49 million in um, the 2022 season. But guess what? The Atlanta Falcons are doing that. Yeah. Terribly sorry, Rich. I hope you enjoy the dynasty title because there ain't going to be one in Atlanta. Um, I just want to just want to note before we go into fancy predictions, man, to go wrong, is that um, Neil did darlings and losers all season for us here on Waxing Lyrical. And um, overall... Um, combined darlings and losers he had a 51% success rate on the information he gives to you I think that is pretty spectacular it's why he's got a blue tick on the Twitter it's why he's on so many websites that I can't even begin to name them and just want to congratulate Neil on, on, on being better than average by 1% being better than average That's by 1% great stone right there. So, yeah. let's move on let's talk about fancy predictions plan to go wrong um, Neil, last week, um, I said the Cooper Cup uh, would smash the um, the uh, receiving record and get 2,000 yards. He needed 266 yards. Um, and then I flicked onto red zone and, and in, in his own half, in his own in his own red zone, Matthew Stafford was thrown pick six. And I thought, oh, it's one of those Matthew Stafford games, is it? Um, Do you think he knows he doesn't have to throw them? No, I don't. I don't think he knows that. I think he's had 15 interceptions and nine of them have been when he's been in his own red zone and six of them have been returned for touchdowns. He does He does like the fact that it's... I mean, most people would say, I don't think we're going to score on this possession. Let's punt it away and see where we go. Whereas he thinks, I don't like where we are now. I'll see where we are in our starting position after the defense, their defence scores a touchdown. Because maybe we'll get a good kickoff return. You know, last year when you said the reason that the, the Rams weren't going to make the Super Bowl was because of the quarterback, and then they got a first-round draft pick and got a quarterback, and someone's going to ask me why they might not make the Super Bowl this year, and I'm going to say the quarterback. That's an issue, right? When you put it that way, yes. Okay. Um, Cuba Cup was still wide receiver six, by the way. <laughs> he had 95 yards and a touchdown, which, as you said, is somehow seen as a bad week. For Cooper Cup, which is crazy. Imagine that being a bad week. <laughs> I know, right? I know, but anyway, it was, so we lost. And you said that Jonathan Taylor would get 250 yards and four scores. He had a mere 108 and one. Again, another bad week for Jonathan Taylor. Um, he's there's another another franchise that is going to be uh, have a, a quarterback away again. But don't worry. They're going to give someone a first-round draft pick for the one that isn't good enough. Bravo, Philadelphia. I don't want to sound bitter, and I don't want to sound, you know, chasing you going to because, be? because, again, I'm not... Where I think Jalen Hurts is the man, I'm not sure he's the guy. But Carson, Jesus Christ, that 2017 season, compared to what the player he is now, oh my God, was he always that bad? He just got some incredible luck in that season or literally was it all the injuries have taken the toll I mean yeah he was coming back from he'd had COVID induced relaxation Mm, are these people actually fit to play I don't know Mm. but at times he has looked like utter filth this year and it's you know as Jimmy Kemsky says on the BGM podcast whenever Jonathan Taylor rips off a 60 yard run there's people you know Carson Wentz is back. You know, it's, it's got nothing. Yeah, he handed it off to him. Congratulations. But then when it comes down to, okay, Carson, we need you to make a play. No, no, for us, not for the other team. You know, it's he has these moments where it's we we talk about the Kirk, the the Kirk coupons that what the hell did you just do play? Whereas Carson Wentz is like, I just I what? <laughs> it's it's it it's always good to be on the other side of that. Roller coaster, just watching it go by and go, whew, God, I'm not on that. Can you imagine being on that? I always remember the veteran newsreader, uh, sorry, uh, journalist uh, John Sargent. He was uh, he was hosting a Vagant News for You once and he was talking about like a, a, Tory, a Tory conference or some type of thing and it was this boring news story and he just went, I'm terribly sorry for laughing, but this time last year I would have had to have been there. <laughs> that's the classic you know it's 
it's great when it's not your car that's on exactly. fire in front exactly. of your house. Exactly, exactly. Um, we won't do fancy predictions for this week. I, I'm going to ask you for um, victors in certain games. Do the Colts beat the Jags? Uh, yes. For the first time since 2014. Um, Steelers v Ravens, it won't matter because the Colts beat the Jags, but who wins? Um, I'm going to say the Ravens just to ruin the Roethlisberger goodbye. Oh no! God, um, he was he, Mayfield looked like shit, which was un- disappointing because of how we expected. Roethlisberger looked worse, and he won how no you again. Can throw forty-six times for one hundred and twenty-three yards in the year of our Lord twenty twenty-two. Oh sweet Jesus! They are eight, seven, and one. Mike Tomlin's a wizard. Tomlin may be a wizard. Um, okay, he hasn't won as many Super Bowls as he should have, or maybe it's just because he didn't. But whatever, I got ben into that debate. Bell and I'm not getting Brown. Into it. That's all I'm going to say. No, I know, I know, I know. Um, 49ers v Rams. Uh, I'm going to say the. I'm going to say the Rams, so, regardless of who plays quarterback. So the then, Falcon, then Saints at Falcons because that means the Taysom. Speaking of Wizards, that means the Taysom Hill Saints are in win and in situation. If the Rams beat the 49ers do you expect the Saints to win? Be nine and eight and make the playoffs. Can you win one nil? Probably. Yeah, they'll, they'll find a way. Um, and then final uh, win and in. Um, LA Chargers v Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, I'm going to take the Chargers. I expect they'll be able to make more plays than the Raiders. Uh, and as I say, I love Derek Carr, um, but I've got to back Justin Herbert to pull a play out of his arse when he needs to. It's going to be fun, no, Neil? Final week, and then it's playoff time. Um, get that Nickelodeon subscription dialed up because it's slime time. Um, and Saints. Um, if you win your game and the, and the uh, Rams Rams beat the 49ers you are on the clock again you be, you, you be, if it's anyone other than the Saints in that Nickelodeon game but we should remember you know you, you put some respect on the MVP that was Mitchell Trubisky Mitchell Trubisky what a, what a time to be alive um, Neil before we go where can people catch you until we're back next week follow me on Twitter at n 13 you can see Throughout the postseason, although teams will start dropping off, my Super Bowl odds tracker at number five. This week's tight end report was more just a few DFS plays. You know, if you fancy dabbling in a bit of daily fantasy in week eighteen, because pff, if you're playing in a if you're playing in a championship game this week in fantasy, seek help. Um, From the commissioner. Yeah, I believe that I will have my fantasy awards being presented on that show on Sunday. Fantastic. Um... Touchdown Review podcast was out on Tuesday night. Great stuff. Um, love talking college because we don't get to do it here. Got to speak to George Somerville again. Um, to the SEC goes the spoils. Dominated the two the two um, college football playoff semi finals and George's um, Alabama Crimson Tide will now play Georgia Bulldogs on Monday night. Um, I would recommend or Monday into Tuesday UK time. I would recommend the watch. Um, follow George because he's the best person who isn't in the America talking about the SEC of that there is no doubt um, spoke to Taib, spoke to Thomas spoke to Joe Balanswela, great stuff Joe was therapeutic because he was talking about Browns because that's his team um, and yeah we did a bit of a seance about it but he was okay in the end um, this show is over um, it's time for bed, Neil's yawning um, so he's going to put his Batman jammies on and go to bed while Batman puts his Neil Dutton jammies on and goes to bed and on that note these top guys are out <laughs>